This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 12 When Mahavy had departed from the house, as related in the preceding chapter, Cory Cory commenced the functions of the post assigned him. He brought us various kinds of food, and, as if I were an infant, insisted upon feeding me with his own hands. To this procedure I, of course, most earnestly objected, but in vain, and having laid a calabash of koku before me, he washed his fingers in a vessel of water, and then putting his hand into the dish and rolling the food into little balls, put them one after another into my mouth. All my remonstrances against this measure only provoked so great a clamor on his part that I was obliged to acquiesce, and the operation of feeding being thus facilitated, the meal was quickly dispatched. As for Toby, he was allowed to help himself after his own fashion. The repast over, my attendant arranged the mats for repose, and, bidding me lie down, covered me with a large robe of tapa, at the same time looking approvingly upon me and exclaiming, Kiki nui nui, ah, moi moi mortarki, eat plenty, ah, sleep very good. The philosophy of this sentiment I did not pretend to question, for deprived of sleep for several preceding nights, and the pain in my limb having much abated, I now felt inclined to avail myself of the opportunity afforded me. The next morning, on waking, I found Cory Cory stretched out on one side of me, while my companion lay upon the other. I felt sensibly refreshed after a night of sound repose, and immediately agreed to the proposition of my valet that I should repair to the water and wash, although dreading the suffering that the exertion might produce. From this apprehension, however, I was quickly relieved, for Cory Cory, leaping from the pee, pee and then backing himself up against it, like a porter in readiness to shoulder a trunk, with loud vociferations and a superabundance of gestures, gave me to understand that I was to mount upon his back and be thus transported to the stream, which flowed perhaps two hundred yards from the house. Our appearance upon the veranda in front of the habitation drew together quite a crowd, who stood looking on and conversing with one another in the most animated manner. They reminded one of a group of idlers gathered about the door of a village tavern when the equipage of some distinguished traveller is brought round previous to his departure. As soon as I clasped my arms about the neck of the devoted fellow, and he jogged off with me, the crowd, composed chiefly of young girls and boys, followed after, shouting and capering with infinite glee, and accompanied us to the banks of the stream. On gaining it, Cory Cory, wading up to his hips in the water, carried me halfway across and deposited me on a smooth black stone which rose a few inches above the surface. The amphibious rabble at our heels plunged in after us, and climbing to the summit of the grass-grown rocks with which the bed of the brook was here and there broken, waited curiously to witness our morning ablutions. Somewhat embarrassed by the presence of the female portion of the company, and feeling my cheeks burning with bashful timidity, I formed a primitive basin by joining my hands together, and cooled my blushes in the water it contained, then removing my frock, bent over and washed myself down to my waist in the stream. As soon as Cory Cory comprehended from my motions that this was to be the extent of my performance, he appeared perfectly aghast with astonishment, and rushing towards me, poured out a torrent of words in eager deprecation of so limited an operation, enjoining me by unmistakable signs to immerse my whole body. To this I was forced to consent, and the honest fellow, regarding me as a froward, inexperienced child, whom it was his duty to serve at the risk of offending, lifted me from the rock and tenderly bathed my limbs. This over, and resuming my seat, I could not avoid bursting into admiration of the scene around me. From the verdant surfaces of the large stones that lay scattered about, the natives were now sliding off into the water, diving and ducking beneath the surface in all directions, the young girls springing buoyantly into the air and revealing their naked forms to the waist, 
with their long tresses dancing about their shoulders, their eyes sparkling like drops of dew in the sun, and their gay laughter pealing forth at every frolicsome incident. On the afternoon of the day that I took my first bath in the valley, we received another visit from Mahavi. The noble savage seemed to be in the same pleasant mood, and was quite as cordial in his manner as before. After remaining about an hour, he rose from the mats, and motioning to leave the house, invited Toby and myself to accompany him. I pointed to my leg, but Mahavi in his turn pointed to Cory Cory and removed that objection. So, mounting upon the faithful fellow's shoulders again, like the old man of the sea astride of Sindbad, I followed after the chief. The nature of the route we now pursued struck me more forcibly than anything I had yet seen, as illustrating the indolent disposition of the islanders. The path was obviously the most beaten one in the valley, several others leading from either side into it, and perhaps for successive generations it had formed the principal avenue of the place. And yet, until I grew more familiar with its impediments, it seemed as difficult to travel as the recesses of a wilderness. Part of it swept round an abrupt rise of ground, the surface of which was broken by frequent inequalities and thickly strewn with projecting masses of rocks, whose summits were often hidden from view by the drooping foliage of the luxuriant vegetation. Sometimes directly over, sometimes evading these obstacles with a wide circuit, the path wound along, one moment climbing over a sudden eminence smooth with continued wear, then descending on the other side into a steep glen and crossing the flinty channel of a brook. Here it pursued the depths of a glade, occasionally obliging you to stoop beneath vast horizontal branches and now you stepped over huge trunks and boughs that lay rotting across the track. Such was the grand thoroughfare of Typee. After proceeding a little distance along it, Cory Cory panting and blowing with the weight of his burden, I dismounted from his back, and grasping the long spear of Mahavi in my hand, assisted my steps over the numerous obstacles of the road, preferring this mode of advance to one which, from the difficulties of the way, was equally painful to myself and my wearied servitor. Our journey was soon at an end, for, scaling a sudden height, we came abruptly upon the place of our destination. I wish that it were possible to sketch in words this spot as vividly as I recollect it. Here were situated the taboo groves of the valley, the scene of many a prolonged feast, of many a horrid rite. Beneath the dark shadows of the consecrated breadfruit trees, there reigned a solemn twilight, a cathedral-like gloom. The frightful genius of pagan worship seemed to brood in silence over the place, breathing its spell upon every object around. Here and there, in the depths of these awful shades, half screened from sight by masses of overhanging foliage, rose the idolatrous altars of the savages, built of enormous blocks of black and polished stone, placed one upon another without cement to the height of twelve or fifteen feet, and surmounted by a rustic open temple, enclosed with a low picket of canes, within which might be seen in various stages of decay, offerings of breadfruit and coconuts, and the putrefying relics of some recent sacrifice. In the midst of the wood was the hallowed Hula Hula Ground, set apart for the celebration of the fantastic religious ritual of these people, comprising an extensive oblong pee terminating at either end in a lofty terraced altar, guarded by ranks of hideous wooden idols and with the two remaining sides flanked by ranges of bamboo sheds, opening towards the interior of the quadrangle thus formed. Vast trees, standing in the middle of this space, and throwing over it an umbrageous shade, had their massive trunks built round with slight stages, elevated a few feet above the ground, and railed in with canes, forming so many rustic pulpits, from which the priests harangued their devotees. This holiest of spots was defended from profanation by the strictest edicts of the all-pervading taboo, which condemned to instant death the sacrilegious female who should enter or touch its sacred precincts, 
or even so much as press with her feet the ground made holy by the shadows that it cast. Access was had to the enclosure through an embowered entrance on one side, facing a number of towering coconut trees planted at intervals along a level area of a hundred yards. At the further extremity of this space was to be seen a building of considerable size, reserved for the habitation of the priests and religious attendants of the groves. In its vicinity was another remarkable edifice, built as usual upon the summit of a pea pea, and at least two hundred feet in length, though not more than twenty in breadth. The whole front of this latter structure was completely open, and from one end to the other ran a narrow veranda, fenced in on the edge of the pea pea with a picket of canes. Its interior presented the appearance of an immense lounging place, the entire floor being strewn with successive layers of mats, lying between parallel trunks of coconut trees, selected for the purpose from the straightest and most symmetrical the vale afforded. To this building, denominated in the language of the natives the T, Mahavi now conducted us. Thus far we had been accompanied by a troop of the natives of both sexes, but as soon as we approached its vicinity, the females gradually separated themselves from the crowd, and standing aloof, permitted us to pass on. The merciless prohibitions of the taboo extended likewise to this edifice, and were enforced by the same dreadful penalty that secured the hula hula ground from the imaginary pollution of a woman's presence. On entering the house, I was surprised to see six muskets ranged against the bamboo on one side, from the barrels of which depended as many small canvas pouches, partly filled with powder. Disposed about these muskets, like the cutlasses that decorate the bulkhead of a man of war's cabin, were a great variety of rude spears and paddles, javelins and war clubs. This, then, said I to Toby, must be the armory of the tribe. As we advanced further along the building, we were struck with the aspect of four or five hideous old wretches, on whose decrepit forms time and tattooing seemed to have obliterated every trace of humanity. Owing to the continued operation of this latter process, which only terminates among the warriors of the island after all the figures sketched upon their limbs in youth have been blended together, an effect, however, produced only in cases of extreme longevity, the bodies of these men were of a uniform, dull green color, the hue which the tattooing gradually assumes as the individual advances in age. Their skin had a frightful, scaly appearance which, united with its singular color, made their limbs not a little resemble dusty specimens of verd antique. Their flesh, in parts, hung upon them in huge folds, like the overlapping plates on the flank of a rhinoceros. Their heads were completely bald, whilst their faces were puckered into a thousand wrinkles, and they presented no vestige of a beard. But the most remarkable peculiarity about them was the appearance of their feet. The toes, like the radiating lines of the mariner's compass, pointed to every quarter of the horizon. This was doubtless attributable to the fact that during nearly a hundred years of existence, the said toes never had been subjected to any artificial confinement, and in their old age, being averse to close neighborhood, bid one another keep open order. These repulsive-looking creatures appear to have lost the use of their lower limbs altogether, sitting upon the floor cross-legged in a state of torpor. They never heeded us in the least, scarcely looking conscious of our presence, while Mahavi seated us upon the mats, and Cory Cory gave utterance to some unintelligible gibberish. In a few moments a boy entered with a wooden trencher of poey poey, and in regaling myself with its contents, I was obliged again to submit to the officious intervention of my indefatigable servitor. Various other dishes followed, the chief manifesting the most hospitable importunity in pressing us to partake, and to remove all bashfulness on our part, set us no despicable example in his own person. The repast concluded, a pipe was lighted, which passed from mouth to mouth, and yielding to its soporific influence, the quiet of the place, and the deepening shadows of approaching night, 
my companion and I sank into a kind of drowsy repose, while the chief and Cory Cory seemed to be slumbering beside us. I awoke from an uneasy nap, about midnight as I supposed, and raising myself partly from the mat, became sensible that we were enveloped in utter darkness. Toby lay still asleep, but our late companions had disappeared. The only sound that interrupted the silence of the place was the asthmatic breathing of the old man I have mentioned, who reposed at a little distance from us. Beside them, as well as I could judge, there was no one else in the house. Apprehensive of some evil, I roused my comrade, and we were engaged in a whispered conference concerning the unexpected withdrawal of the natives, when all at once, from the depths of the grove, in full view of us where we lay, shoots of flame were seen to rise, and in a few moments illuminated the surrounding trees, casting by contrast into still deeper gloom the darkness around us. While we continued gazing at this sight, dark figures appeared moving to and fro before the flames, while others, dancing and capering about, looked like so many demons. Regarding this new phenomenon with no small degree of trepidation, I said to my companion, "'What can all this mean, Toby?' "'Oh, nothing,' replied he. "'Getting the fire ready, I suppose?' "'Fire?' exclaimed I, while my heart took to beating like a trip-hammer. "'What fire?' "'Why, the fire to cook us, to be sure. What else would the cannibals be kicking up such a row about, if it were not for that?' "'Oh, Toby, have done with your jokes. This is no time for them. Something is about to happen, I feel confident.' "'Jokes, indeed!' exclaimed Toby indignantly. "'Did you ever hear me joke? "'Why, for what do you suppose the devils have been feeding us up in this kind of style during the last three days? "'Unless it were for something that you are too much frightened at to talk about. "'Look at that Cory Cory there. "'Has he not been stuffing you with his confounded mushes "'just in the way they treat swine before they kill them? "'Depend upon it. "'We will be eaten this blessed night, "'and there is the fire we shall be roasted by.' This view of the matter was not at all calculated to allay my apprehensions, and I shuddered when I reflected that we were indeed at the mercy of a tribe of cannibals, and that the dreadful contingency to which Toby had alluded was by no means removed beyond the bounds of possibility. "'There, I told you so. They are coming for us,' exclaimed my companion the next moment, as the forms of four of the islanders were seen in bold relief against the illuminated background, mounting the pp and approaching towards us. They came on noiselessly, nay, stealthily, and glided along through the gloom that surrounded us as if about to spring upon some object they were fearful of disturbing before they should make sure of it. Gracious heaven, the horrible reflections which crowded upon me that moment! A cold sweat stood upon my brow, and spellbound with terror I awaited my fate. Suddenly the silence was broken by the well-remembered tones of Mahavy, and at the kindly accents of his voice my fears were immediately dissipated. Tamo, Toby, Kiki, Eat. He had waited to address us until he had assured himself that we were both awake, at which he seemed somewhat surprised. Kiki, is it? said Toby in his gruff tones. Well, cook us first, will you? But what's this? he added, as another savage appeared, bearing before him a large trencher of wood, containing some kind of steaming meat, as appeared from the odors it diffused, and which he deposited at the feet of Mahavy. "'A baked baby, I dare say, but I will have none of it. Never mind what it is. A pretty fool I should make of myself indeed, waked up here in the middle of the night, stuffing and guzzling, and all to make a fat meal for a parcel of bloody-minded cannibals one of these mornings.' No, I see what they are at very plainly, so I am resolved to starve myself into a bunch of bones and gristle, and then, if they serve me up, they are welcome. But I say, Tomo, you are not going to eat any of that mess there in the dark, are you? Why, how can you tell what it is? By tasting it, to be sure, said I, masticating a morsel that Cory Cory had just put in my mouth. And excellently good it is, too, very much like veal. A baked baby by the soul of Captain Cook! burst forth Toby with amazing vehemence. Veal? Why, there never was a calf on the island till you landed. 
I tell you, you are bolting down mouthfuls from a dead Hapar's carcass, as sure as you live, and no mistake. Emetics and lukewarm water. What a sensation in the abdominal regions. Sure enough, where could the fiends incarnate have obtained meat? But I resolved to satisfy myself at all hazards, and turning to Mahavi, I soon made the ready chief understand that I wished a light to be brought. When the taper came, I gazed eagerly into the vessel, and recognized the mutilated remains of a juvenile porker. Puarki, exclaimed Kori Kori, looking complacently at the dish, and from that day to this I have never forgotten that such is the designation of a pig in the Taipee lingo. The next morning, after being again abundantly feasted by the hospitable Mahavi, Toby and myself arose to depart, but the chief requested us to postpone our intention. Abo, abo, wait, wait, he said, and accordingly we resumed our seats, while, assisted by the zealous Kori Kori, he appeared to be engaged in giving directions to a number of the natives outside, who were busily employed in making arrangements the nature of which we could not comprehend. But we were not left long in our ignorance, for a few moments only had elapsed when the chief beckoned us to approach, and we perceived that he had been marshalling a kind of guard of honor to escort us on our return to the house of Marheyo. The procession was led off by two venerable-looking savages, each provided with a spear, from the end of which streamed a pennon of milk-white tapa. After them went several youths, bearing aloft calabashes of poey poey, and followed in their turn by four stalwart fellows sustaining long bamboos, from the tops of which hung suspended at least twenty feet from the ground, large baskets of green breadfruit. Then came a troop of boys, carrying bunches of ripe bananas, and baskets made of the woven leaflets of coconut boughs, filled with the young fruit of the tree, the naked shells stripped of their husks peeping forth from the verdant wickerwork that surrounded them. Last of all came a burly islander, holding over his head a wooden trencher, in which lay disposed the remnants of our midnight feast, hidden from view, however, by a covering of breadfruit leaves. Astonished as I was at this exhibition, I could not avoid smiling at its grotesque appearance, and the associations it naturally called up. Mahavi, it seemed, was bent on replenishing old Marheyo's larder, fearful perhaps that without this precaution his guests might not fare as well as they could desire. As soon as I descended from the pipi, the procession formed anew, enclosing us in its center, where I remained part of the time, carried by Kori Kori, and occasionally relieving him from his burden by limping along with a spear. When we moved off in this order, the natives struck up a musical recitative, which, with various alternations, they continued until we arrived at the place of our destination. As we proceeded on our way, bands of young girls, darting from the surrounding groves, hung upon our skirts, and accompanied us with shouts of merriment and delight, which almost drowned the deep notes of the recitative. On approaching old Marheyo's domicile, its inmates rushed out to receive us, and while the gifts of Mahavi were being disposed of, the superannuated warrior did the honors of his mansion with all the warmth of hospitality evinced by an English squire when he regales his friends at some fine old patrimonial mansion.' 